Thank you for coming. Bishala, that's the wrong. You can find it on page 366. So, I can start? Director? Yeah, yeah, please. Please. Will you direct her? Okay. Imagine the following scenario. Okay, you have the following scenario. Uh, you're sitting at home one day and you're listening to a classical music station. Uh, 96.3. Right? It is a crazy world, we agree. And they say there's a trip. If you're the, you know, the third caller, you call in right now, you win a trip to... To where? Yeah, go ahead. I, uh, Germany. Nah, Germany. I, I need Bahamas. You know, let's, let's talk. You know, let's talk about warmth here. Or to the land of the Jews. You know, to to to, to, to Boca, to Fort Lauderdale. Okay. You get a call. So you 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 know you hear warmth and you hear free trip. So you run to the phone and Mazel Tov, you're the third caller. A big simcha. So there's a flight out. You know, once a week they have these flights out. So it's, uh, it's, it's a Monday morning, and you decide your flight is at 10 a.m., but, you know, you take your time at home a little bit. You know, it's very exciting. You want to be sure that you have the sunscreen, and you're packing, and... You, yeah, you missed the flight. But I, I, I wasn't <laughs> extending <laughs> 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 You didn't estimate, you didn't estimate your traffic the way you should have. I thought you were going to say Mr. Shearer. No. So uh, you get onto the 401, right? And there's a big sign on the 401 uh, that there's an accident on the collector. So you take, of course, the express. But guess what? Everyone else is taking the express as well. So you ride to the airport and said 25 minutes takes you 50, 55 minutes, 55 minutes, and yes, you miss your flight. You miss your flight to the vacation that you were waiting for. So you call the station and they say, guess what? Good news is that they have the same exact flight in in a week from now. In a week from now. Okay. So during that week period, right? Let's let's assess your emotions here. Uh, there's a level of, within you, you're a little bit happy about the fact that you won the contest, or whatever it was, you won the free flight to South Florida. But on the other hand, you're kicking yourself for your klutzkite, that you left to the airport too late. <coughs> okay, you're kicking yourself for the klutzkite. Now, when it comes to your happiness, there's nothing you need to do based on that emotion. I mean, you should be thankful, right? You should wake up every morning, and when you see that in Toronto it's minus 4, and in South Florida it's uh, 24, you should be happy about it, knowing that in 5 days, 4 days, for now you're going there. So for the good, you should be appreciative. What about for the klotzkite, for the bad, for the fact that you did not give yourself enough time to get to the airport? What should you be doing? You should be planning better. Right? You should pack the night before. Uh, you should also leave to the airport a little bit earlier. Right? That's what you should do for your planning. So that's what's happening during that week. You get that's the state of the individual during that week? Well, are you the type to kick yourself more or to appreciate more? I have other people to kick me. <laughs> 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 That's a good sign that you can share with the public. <laughs> so, you know, you have that, those struggles that you are going for. So now, now that you understand what we are talking about, that's how you have to approach Parsha's Bishala, by the way. And it works as follows. As a nation, as a nation, what we read about in Parsha's Bo is about this incredible gift given to the Jewish people, it's a gift we're supposed to share with others, the concept of freedom, the concept of uh, a, a Jewish, the formation of a Jewish home, of Jewish values, being a servant to the Almighty, not a servant to man, your identity. There are so many incredible things that we read about in Parashat Bo. 
That is the gift. That is that trip that you got. The Klotzkite believe, begins right here. In other words, this is a portion about the nation of Israel. Yes, incredible journey they are going on, but they made some mistakes. They made some serious mistakes, and it's going to be the focus of the Klotzkite of the people of Israel, that they had such an opportunity, but things simply did not go the way they should. Okay, so that's an introduction to Parashat Vaishlach. Inshallah. Inshallah. Always claim that, right? We're good. We're good. Yeah. Now, imagine you are Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu. Abraham Avinu, in our tradition, and even the text itself indicates, we're dealing with a perfect person who communicates with God. Uh, we are dealing with a person that values humanity. He values values. Uh, he is given this gift of continuity. He has, he has a child. He has Yitzchak. And he knows that his his, due to the fact that what was important for him was to have an impact on the world, that the world should recognize that there's a higher being. And that was very, very important for him. <coughs> so when he finds out that he has a, a, a child, that there's continuity, the happiness is not just an emotional one, but rather his mission is alive. You live forever. That's what we know. You know that there, when there's continuity, the person lives forever. So Avram knows he is living forever. There is, you know, in a hundred years from now, right? Well, maybe he would be around in a hundred years from now, because he lived till age 175. But we know, you know, you know, there's continuity. There is continuity there. However, he knows as well that his children are going to go through, his descendants are going to go through a dark period. They're going to be enslaved. They're going to go through difficulty. But after that, he is told, They're going to leave with great wealth. It is very hard to believe that the great wealth that he envisioned was gold and silver and, and fancy clothes. Most probably what he envisioned was some kind of tradition, some kind of revelation that his children may not, they may not be on the highest level, but they're going to experience a revelation. And the purpose of that revelation is that they can have an impact on the world. So this is what Avram Avinu is thinking of. So if things would have gone right, because remember, this is the portion when things simply do not go as they should. And when we talk about the things that did not go as they should, it's not to be negative, but it's to be mindful of it for us to try to fix those problems, for us to pack on time and leave on time to uh, the airport, correct? This is the idea behind it. We're not negative. We simply want to learn from those mistakes. That's what we're trying to do. So now... Things go wrong because the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, they leave Egypt. And they are on their way to receive this great wealth. But step number one to be worthy of the revelation and the teachings, step number one is to fully recognize that these awesome and incredible events that just occurred were the work of a higher being, of the Almighty, of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. This is what should have happened, right? Recognition. And what should have happened is that if CNN would interview the average Jew leaving, right? Leaving Egypt. So first of all, they would blame them for the devastation of what occurred in Egypt. But after that, if they would ask them, if they would ask them, what, how did you leave? In other words, what happened, you know? You've been there for a period of over 200 years. No one leaves Egypt. It's a superpower. How do things occur? How did it happen? The proper response, and a re response that would indicate that this is a nation that is ready to go out and embrace their rechush gadol, their great mission, the proper response would have been, what do you mean there is an almighty? We sense there's a creator. 
and therefore it is a Kodesh Baruch who took us out of Egypt. Hotzianu mimitzrayim. That should have been the right answer, and that would have been things working as they should. But the problem is that sometimes when we have a mentality, when we have a mentality, we go ahead and read and assess new circumstances with an old mentality. Right? You take the establishment of the Jewish state. Establishment of a Jewish state. So, you know, I come from a school that believes that it, was a, it is supernatural. This is a gift from above. You've got to use gifts right, right? Like all gifts, you have to know how to use it. But you have to be appreciative to the Kodesh Baruch Hu that the Jewish people that you had, you have to envision. And what you have to do is, on a daily basis, is think about the many, many Jews who are homeless, basically, or in DP camps, or locked up in Cyprus, and have absolutely nowhere to go, right? And these are people, and there are many, many such instances, people that already were kicked out of their homes in the, in the 1930s. Right? My, take, I take my grandmother an example. She did not land up in Israel, but it's a perfect example of my grandmother, who already during the turmoil in the, of the 1930s, she left her home but stayed within Poland. But then in 1939, she illegally crosses from northern Poland into Lithuania, but then has to run away from Lithuania in 1941 and lands up in Shanghai. And eventually, when does she settle somewhere? in 1946, right? So this is basically a decade, and this is a story of every single person that we could, that of, of, of parents and grandparents and relatives that we know of, 10 years of no idea what's going on, of no idea, no stability. And she settles in 1946, right, in Cleveland, Ohio, where she is supposed to adjust uh, to a uh, new language, English, a new culture, a new culture, and the fact that knowing that her siblings and her mother and are, all, are, are all ashes now. So this is the new reality that that generation had to deal with. And this is what's happening with our nation. And then in 1948, we have an identity. We have a home. It's a home for people. And it's also a, a, a pride for the fact that we as a nation, we have indeed our national identity. So now you interview a, a Jew, interview a Jew about what occurred in 1948. So there's the proper response. The proper response is, you know, this is a gift from above. What do we do with it? Well, let's remember, we have, a, we have to be sure to infuse tradition into this Jewish state, not allow it to run wild because there are those within, or at that time, even the leaders of the Jewish state had a very foreign agenda to our values when it comes to the direction of the state. But it should be viewed as a gift from above. What would be the wrong attitude? The wrong attitude is to take an outlook and to take a philosophy that you've been living with up until that, that <clears throat> point and ignore, right, ignore the miracle that's occurring and explain it politically. And you come up with a political explanation. Well, after all, uh, you know, the second half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century is about uh, nation nationalism and self-determination. So eventually it is logical that after the Holocaust that the Jews are given a homeland, you start giving, when you start using your political science background to explain it and push God out of the picture, and when you start taking that which you've grown up with, that which you've studied, and don't see the fact that there is something very special occurring, that's a problem. That is a serious problem. And this is occurring to our ancestors as well. They've been in Egypt for many, many decades, and even though they were mistreated there, and even though they were enslaved there, and even though they were beaten there, the fact is they viewed themselves as Egyptians, and they were very proud of their Egyptian culture, right? and they would be willing to do anything for Pharaoh, because the culture of Egypt is, Egypt is Pharaoh runs the world, and if Pharaoh runs the world, we got to go ahead and appreciate and pray for the welfare of Pharaoh because we are, after all, Egyptians, right? I mean, you could think about German Jews that even, you know, even into the, the Hitler era still view themselves as Germans, right? Something about the German Jew. I could even talk about, you know, my grandfather, who was a God-fearing Jew, right? A very, a very special man, but 
pride in Germany was so much part of his identity that one of the last trips, and perhaps the last trip he took out of Lakewood, New Jersey, uh, in his late 80s, was to make his way to a consulate in Philadelphia to officially be reinstated as a German citizen. That's what he wanted. He wanted, so in 1933 he lost his citizenship, but in 1998, we, I, I flew down with my older brother, we rented a car, we drove him from Lakewood to Philadelphia, uh, I took him up, my brother Park was a whole to-do to have him come upstairs and be welcome back. For him it was important, for, for Zadie it was important, right? with the black hat and with all, all the humors you could ever imagine or you don't want to imagine. It was all part of his identity, this is a German Jew, but it's a German and he, this was something that was important for him. That is the Jew. L loyalty to country, loyalty to the way of thinking of society. So if you interview the Jew as he is leaving Egypt and you ask him, you've left thanks to Pharaoh, that would be the answer. Pharaoh sent us. Pharaoh sent, yeah. That's what's happening and that's how this tragic portion begins. This portion that again is a portion that indicates that things have gone wrong. Vayehi v'shalach paro et ha'am. Oops, paro et ha'am. Are you out of your mind? Did you not read the Haggadah? Ilu lo tzianu me mitzrayim. Nope, but the am, the nation itself, the average person, the person that was perhaps not on the highest level, but not the most educated, not that fully understood what was happening, saw miracles, and indeed that there are forces, supernatural forces intervened. We do not fully comprehend them. There is probably a Jewish God. But bottom line is who signed, who signed the bill, right? Whose signature was it that gave us, it was an executive order, obviously, from right, Pharaoh that freed us. That indicates that there is a problem here. Now... Abraham Avinu understood that his, that his descendants are going to be fulfilling a mission that is similar to his mission. To have an impact on the world, an impact on humanity. Right? That's clearly... Coffee? Tissue. Just tissue. <laughs> you got the mother. I start off with a marshal about getting to the airport right on time. I just want to make it clear that I just got back from the airport from taking Moshe back to the airport, and he got there on time. So don't <laughs> think that the marshal indicates anything about uh, the made it or Hashem was very... Now, Avraham Avinu, Avraham Avinu, he has a vision, my children are going to be doing what I did, right? Having an impact on the world. And we also know that there's a concept of that the actual actions performed by Avraham Avinu are ones that the children follow the same set. He is establishing some kind of pattern. So now, if the nation of Israel are leaving Egypt to get this gift that we call revelation and tradition and begin the process of reaching out, where would be the ideal location to do it? Where would be the ideal location? So now, we have to look back at Avraham Avinu. Where did Avraham Avinu have significant impact? Or, where do we find that Avraham Avinu comes to a place and he sees that there are ethics there, but nevertheless he feels that, yes, indeed, uh, you have ethics that are logical, ethics that are rational, but if, if they are man-made, they're going to be flawed. And if you don't have Yirat Elohim, Abraham Avinu told some people these words, if you do not have the fear of God, you will not succeed. These ethics and these values are not going to be long-lasting long without Yirat Elohim. And the local king says to him, you know what? You could stay here. Stay, stay in this area. Right? Abraham Avinu had some issues with the Egyptians. What did they do? They told him, leave, get out, right? After there was an intervention. When on the other hand, he dealt with the king of the Philistines, right? He, he, he guided them. He tells the king, right? He tells Avimelech, you should know you, you're lacking the fear of God. And Avimelech responds, you know what? Guess what? You could stay here. Stay here. Stay, you know, have an impact. 
have an impact. Yes, there were back and there were issues that existed with the children, but nevertheless, Avram Avinu did have an impact. The man that is concerned about the welfare of others, that wants to take care of their physical needs and guide them through it, that you should know that that which you lack, right, you know the, the, the bracha we make, if you go out and uh, uh, eat a piece of uh, uh, chocolate or if you drink a cup of coffee and you drink the right amount within a, a specific period of time, you make a bracha achrona. Right, Baruch Ata Hashem, Lakinu Matulam, Borene Fashot Rabot, that you Allah Almighty created many souls, Veches Ronam, and their deficiencies, or lackings, right? The things they lack. <coughs> Thank you, God, for creating <coughs> creatures, right? We humans, and that which we lack. Why are we thanking Him? Well, when we lack something, right, we have a need. When it's suddenly fulfilled, I wake up in the morning, I need a coffee. Right? I need, I need caffeine. I have my caffeine. I'm supposed to turn to the online and say, Rabban Shalom, first of all, I thank you for making me need that caffeine because I sense I have a need for something. And when you give it to me, I can appreciate you. So now suddenly the caffeine is not there just to give me caffeine, but it's for me to appreciate the fact that wisdom was given to man to go ahead and figure out how to get from these berries or thank the Almighty that some goat in, uh, in, in Ethiopia ate some berries and started jumping around and they realized that it's on a, a caffeine high. So the idea is that when there is a saron, that there are lackings, there are, when there are lackings, you sense that, you know what, I'm lacking something. Now that I have it, oh, what a pleasure. Contrast is always how we appreciate things. When do you appreciate good weather? When you are in Toronto for the winter, right? In the summer in Toronto, you could have day upon day with decent weather, and like, you know, you're the same, you could be at the same level of, you know, you know the depression or lack of appreciation like you are during the winter. It's an incredible thing about humans. Think about it, right? If you have a way of assessing your level of happiness after three weeks of the cold, right? It's not, you know, it's not say. But go ahead and assess yourself during the summer. When there's contrast, there's appreciation. When you need a meal, and, you, and then suddenly you have it, there's appreciation, that's a moment of recognizing God. This is a message that Abraham Avinu gave to every person walking into his tent. He would not just give out meals, but he gave them meals, and he taught them the, a concept. You know what you were lacking? Now you have it. You're appreciative. There's a higher being, and he wants you to appreciate him. And that's what existence is about. You have an area that's lacking, and then it's taken care of, right? There was a, 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 a health issue, but then, Be'ezer, Sashem, Be'karov, you feel much, much better. You say, Rabbi Shalom, I truly, truly appreciate it. This is the message of Avram Avinu. It works well, and who will understand it? Rational people, right? People that have values will appreciate this idea. Abraham Avinu was reaching out and teaching people in the land of the Philistines. Yes? I don't know if a rational person who just went through the Holocaust would appreciate that there's a God out there when, when the state of Israel was formed. I mean, they would look at it more from a, like you said, from a political science point of view, because they'd be going, like, where was God? Like, how would you rationalize that? So, so two things I can say. Number one, there's no question that Holocaust survivors are, are free from any belief. Like, you can't, we, we can't really understand. It is supernatural to think that any of them have any faith at all. At the same time, I, hear, I, hear, I read of many, many stories of the survivor being comforted when they knew, you know what? God has, has shown himself again, right? He concealed himself, and he has revealed himself. So, and I, I can tell you that there's people that they, the comfort level that the knowledge, even those who did not live there, the knowledge that there is a Jewish state gave them comfort. So, I, I don't, I, you know, for me, this, these are people that are all great people, right? When, uh, but it, it, seemed to be, it seems to work like that somehow. And again, the Holocaust is not, is beyond. There are things, part of being a committed Jew is accepting the fact, is, is being humble. And humility is there are things that simply I will never understand, right? You know, there's two things that I believe in, that there, that there is a God, and he's a God of kindness, and I also believe there was a Holocaust, right? And the two does, just don't go, don't work. They simply don't work. But the third thing I believe is that I don't, I'm not going to understand everything, but uh, that, that's, how I, that's how I sense it. It's a good, ster it's a good stereo for such a small device, no? It's amazing. Ah. The Steve Jobs.
So now, so with that, where if the children of Israel, if this generation, that are going to experience revelation and are going to follow the footsteps of Avraham Avinu, where should they land up to have that impact? Personally, I think in the land of the Philistines. However, do you agree with it? It should make sense. Walk into the land of the Philistines, experience a revelation there. And revelation should be with people around. They should see it. They should sense it. You should be part of the human race as you experience revelation because the purpose of the revelation, the purpose of Ma'amad, what we call Ma'amad Har Sinai, the purpose is for the sake of humanity. We're not a selfish nation. We're not a nation that views the world as infidels and you know, perhaps you know, there are other religions that really deep down in the core belief is others are infidels, but they understand that we have to package it and present it in a more friendlier way, and therefore it is unclear, at least for the outside, what the religion deep down believes. We deep down believe we have a significant role towards humanity, and therefore logically the quote-unquote revelation should have been among other human beings, that they should see it and experience it, and then know that we have a specific role. Now that would only work if we are on the right track. That would only work if the experience of the Tziat Mitzrayim would have had the full impact. It did not. And therefore this verse tells us the following. Number one, <laughs> problem number one. Vahi b'shalach paroi ta'am, the nation itself sensed that it was Pharaoh who sent them out. And as a result, God did not lead them in the way of the land of Philistines. Why? Kikarovu. It is, it is near Egypt. Or it could also be philosophically, this is a weak nation that when there's any battle, physical battle, internal battle, they're going to return to Egypt. This is a nation that we have to readjust the route due to the weak or due to the fact that they were not fully impacted by the experience. This is what verse number one of this week's portion tells us, and this is really going to guide us throughout this whole portion. It's a nation, we did things wrong. Okay, that's what it's all about. With this introduction, right, we can understand a little bit more about the Shira, about the Shira. So now let's move forward. Eventually, the Egyptians follow them into the sea, they come out, the waters cover the Egyptians, and the nation itself, you could imagine, after bundling up their pain for decades and their suffering, and finally they are released when they see the power of Egypt, the chariot, the horsemen. This symbolizes the superpower down on the bottom of the ocean. That's when they sense, you know what, we could praise God. So let's turn to page 374. And we're going to analyze one detail which I think we've touched upon in the past. As then, Yashir Moshe Uvenei Yisrael Atashira Hazot. Then, at that moment, they chose to sing a song to Hashem. Vayomru Lemor. They said the following. <clears throat> now, what you're going to read in the second half of the first verse is the chorus. So therefore, what, as, at least it seems that they would say one section of the Shira and then return to the chorus. And the next section of the Shira and return to the chorus. So what is the chorus, which is obviously the core and the, the, the main message of the Shira? A Shira la Hashem. I shall sing to Hashem. Ki ga'o, ga, he is exalted above the arrogant. Egypt symbolized power, the superpower of the region. No way of getting out. You would talk to an Egyptian and you would say to him, one day people are going to leave Egypt. Impossible. It is something that's not fathomable. It's not really doable. <coughs> we have, we symbolize power in this world. And comes the Almighty and he what? He exalted himself above them. The nation sings. And this is symbolized by the fact that they see the chariot, right? The tank, the missiles. Right? Why do nations seek nuclear weapons? It's a sign that there is somebody, right? That uh, the Meshuggah, uh, Kim Jong, uh, of, I have to be careful, we have to be edited, I don't want to mess with him, right? So he believed, you know, you have a nuclear weapon, then you're a somebody. You want to be a somebody in those days? It was the chariot. You see the chariot on the bottom of the sea, on the bottom 
of the Yamsuf, then they can go ahead, Ashira la Hashem ki goga. I will praise Hashem, he is exalted above the arrogant, because Sus, Verochva, the horse, and the rider were thrown into the sea, Ramabaya. Then we continue with the, the Shira, which we are familiar with. Fine. Ashira la Hashem. Ashira. I shall sing. I shall sing. It is future tense. Future. In the future. What do you mean? Sing now. No. Well, you'll say, well, sometimes when a person says, you know, I shall do something, you will use terminology of future tense, even though you're doing it right now. Perhaps. But let's move on right after the Shira and see the role that the women play. And it is led by Vatikach Miriam, so on page 380. And she too is going to run, run the Shira to the women. And there's going to be a chorus as well. But there's going to be a small adjustment to the chorus. Vatikach Miriam Hot Aharon. Miriam, the prophetess, takes the drum. And the women go out and dances, and she leads them. She spoke up to them, and she says to them in verse 21, Vatan la Miriam, Shiru la Hashem ki go'o ga'a, sus verochvo ramabayam. Same thing, with one small adjustment. Not Ashira, but Shiru. Sing now. You sing now. Why the adjustment? So now, uh, the attitude, something that I think among the, the many things that fascinate me in, uh, in my own Jewish education is the attitude towards the Gentiles, right? The Jewish attitude towards the world out there. It's always fascinated me. And... The, the fact that when you have any extreme approach, it is very dangerous for your Jewish identity, right? If you have an extreme approach uh, that we are no different than any other human being and all are created in the image of God, which is true, right? And if those are the values that, are, uh, are, are, that you will hear in the home, if a child grows up hearing, Jews, Gentiles, they're good Jews, they're bad Jews, and they only hear that, and there's no pride of their identity, I would be quite concerned with our ability to transmit to our children the uniqueness of what we are about. Right? On the other hand, if we raise our children with the goyim, ah, they're, they're, you know, goy, they're no good. The goyim, ah, they're all shikarim, and they're all gavaryo, they're all criminal. Very, very problematic for many, many reasons. Uh, number one, our tradition does teach us that God created all humans in the image of God. You're supposed to value every single human being, right? Uh, there was a, there's a story, I think his name was Rav Shisko. I think he was a son-in-law of Rav Moshe. And he was walking with a group of boys somewhere in the New York area, in, in, in one of the holy lands of the five boroughs. And he's walking with a few of the young boys, and there was a drunk there laying on, 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 in the gutter. And this Rav Shisko went, goes ahead and assisted the non-Jewish drunk to sit down, and he helped him out a little bit. Students were surprised. And he tells them, what do you mean? We just saw someone that is made in the image of God in a state that's not honorable. You go ahead and do your part. Selam Elohim. Selam Elohim, the image of God. And you have to, we have this challenge of balancing it, balancing it, of reminding them that, yes, all humans are valuable. And we have actually a mission, that eventually we have a mission of being a nation of priests, Mamlechet Kohanim. We are a nation that we're supposed to reach out, and the, the actions of the Jewish person are supposed to inspire humanity. And when once in a while we get those stories, when once in a while you hear in the news the word rabbi and uh, good behavior, when once in a while you get one of those stories, you feel those are the stories, that's our responsibility, that's what we are about. When a rabbi returns $98,000 that he finds in an old desk 
and he does the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying the name of God for being ethical, those are the stories that we like. Right? You should buy a filter, maybe Google could help us, create a filter that the 90% of stories that have rabbi and arrested or jail term or bribery should somehow be filtered out. And the stories of rabbi goes ahead and assists people like in Fort Lauderdale after the shooting. Right? So the Chabad rabbi there runs to the airport to go ahead and help people. And those are the stories that we feel that's what we are about. Right? So as Jews... We feel responsibility towards humanity. Now, when is a time, you're sitting with children, you're sitting with children, grandchildren, and you want to go ahead and convey the idea that Judaism believes that all humans are valuable. When is the time, sitting together at a yontif, when can you achieve it? Well, you can achieve it several times. Sukkot is a good time, because you read the Haftorah the first day, you talk about the fact that it's a holiday for all the nations, and there is going to be an expectation in the Messianic era that all nations of the world come to Jerusalem to show their appreciation because the temple is a house of prayer for all the nations. A nice way to convey the message. Another time is actually when we commemorate the crossing of the sea. Because as we are crossing the sea, and we say Shira, nevertheless, when we commemorate that occasion, as you all know, our Hallel is not complete. The second half of Pesach, we do not, we omit two paragraphs of, paragraphs of the Hallel. We call it, we call it half the Hallel. Probably some Jewish accountant worked it out that you take up two sections and it turned into half. <laughs> but I can't, that you could discern perhaps. But the reality is that we take out those sections because we're trying to convey a message. This Song is a song of appreciation, and we have to show our gratitude to the Almighty for the fact that we survived. But at the same time, let's remember that this is not an ideal salvation. When enemies and the evil people die, it's uh, necessary, but tragic. The ideal and the complete salvation, and when we talk about a messianic era, and when we talk about the true mission of the people of Israel, when we talk about the fact that we are going to follow the lead of Avraham and Sarah by having an impact on the world, it is not that the evil will die, but the evil will recognize God. And therefore, we have to make reference to it when it comes to the reading of the Shira, right? We have to, there has to be a hint there that this is a song, but it's not the ideal song. The ideal song is going to be in the future. Ashira la Hashem. A day will come when I could go ahead and give a complete song. So even though, yes, the basic meaning was that they were thankful at that point and they should have appreciation and should show their gratitude in song to the Almighty for the fact that they were saved, but at the same time, there should be a hint. This is not the ideal song. The ideal song is when the evil doer recognizes, you know what, this is not the proper approach. Ashira in the future, there is going to be a song in the future, and even the word as, as, as yashir, then, at some point in the future, we're going to have a complete shira, and then we can have a complete halel. So that is the idea of why the shira that we are familiar with begins with reference to the future. This is not the ideal. And this is a portion, this whole portion is all about when the Jewish person took something incredible, and due to the fact that they are on the not, on the right level, things go wrong. And if you read the second half of the Parsha, even the fact that they have the mana, but they don't know how to deal with it, right? Even the fact that when they are introduced to Shabbat, which is our whole identity, uh, they're not informed about it on time. And the end of the Parsha, B'Shalach, is an attack by the nation of which symbolizes the evil that exists in the world up until the Messianic era. Why? Because this is a portion that talks about the long journey home. That we begin the process of Yitziat Mitzrayim, but instead of completing it right then and reaching our final mission, it takes a good 3,500 years, 400 years, give or take, until we actually complete it. That is what the Parsha is about. However, however, there are those who have the ability that even when there is bitterness, even when there is their own personal bitterness, they see the sweet, they see the good. They have the ability that even when there is suffering, they somehow see, you know what, there's good here. 
That is, of course, Miriam Hanaviyah, right? If you look through her life story, and you look at the fact that the rabbis tell us that as she's a child, there's a decree from Pharaoh that males will be thrown into the Nile. Her parents separate, and she goes ahead and says, you know what, this is not the proper thing to your parents. I think you should reunite. You do your part. There's a bitter decree. That's not your business. Just accept the bitterness, and if you accept it with faith, that itself is sweet. And if you read the section right after Miriam on page 300, and we are told that they traveled three days and they did not find water. And then they reach a place called, at the end of page 380, verse 23. They came to Marah. They could not drink the waters of Marah. They were bitter. So they complain and they throw in an etz. This is on page 382, verse 25. They cry out to God. He shows them a tree. They threw it into the water. It becomes sweet. The mar becomes sweet with faith and the word of God. This is what we are being told here. That appears right after Miriam is mentioned because that is the essence of Miriam. If it is the word of God, even if there's bitterness, it is sweet. Right now, I can appreciate any state. Miriam has the ability of going through any state and any, cha any challenge and seeing if it is the will of God, there's sweetness here. She doesn't have to look to the future. She can appreciate somehow a very high spiritual level. She can and appreciates the now. Such a personality, even when things are not in the ideal, could say, Shiru la Hashem. Sing to God. That's why she has that ability. Vatikach on page 380. Miriam Anevia doesn't have to go ahead and say, Ah, she in the future. She recognizes that this is not the <coughs> ideal. She recognizes that we as Jews want humanity not to die, but to recognize God. She knows it. But her ability is that it makes no difference what the circumstances are. I'm going to sing to God now. Shiru la Hashem. And that's why she makes that adjustment. So this explains to us this difference between Ashira and Shiro, but it tells us about what this Parsha is about, that the Jewish nation experienced this awesome gift of Yitziat Mitzrayim in our spiritual journey, but we simply were not on the right level to complete it, to clinch it, right? It's not enough to start off good. You have to end it good. And if you want to find an example, go to Atlanta today. Right. Atlanta is a city, great city, great city, huge city, but the Atlanta Falcons symbolize this idea that it's not enough to just start off good, you have to end good as well, because otherwise, of course, Tom Brady is going to win the Super Bowl. Thank you for coming, and everyone have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week.